Today on the show, you and I discuss the death of a military hero's dignity at the hands of Donald Trump, and we talk about what it is to be truly self-made. Welcome to the future where the glass is half full and you'll need new glasses, where you'll be jumping from conclusions. The past is a no, and a new future is born. Never before in history has so much meant so little to so many. AD on the radio. So do you remember the first time your dignity was tested, your ethics were tested, your personal moral code was tested. Your sense of what was right and what was wrong was tested. A time where maybe you were asked to go along to get along, and it represented a big compromise for you. Do you remember the first time you became aware of that? For me, I remember it very clearly. It was a sleepover at my buddy Justin's house. And the other kids that were sleeping over... We were staying up late. We were watching horror movies. We were having a great old time doing what kids in the sixth or seventh grade do. And everyone went, I've got a great idea. Let's go. Let's go toilet paper somebody else's house. We're going to egg it. We're going to toilet paper. It's going to be awesome. And I was like, ooh, that that doesn't sound like something I want to do. Thinking to myself, why? I mean, yeah, there's a certain amount of satisfaction. But there's no justice in these actions. It's not like we know the people that live in that house that are going to get egged and toilet papered are bad people. And ultimately, toilet papering somebody else's house, that's just kids being kids. It's what it is. But I remember sitting there going, no, no, I'm not going to do that. You coming? No. No, I'm going to stay here and watch the rest of this horror movie. I made the decision. I was glad I made the decision. And it separated me a little bit from those kids that night. They went out. They had a great time. They didn't see anything wrong with it. It was a bonding experience for them. They had a blasty blast. They came back laughing and hooting and hollering and having had a great old time. And then the next day they went and surveyed their handiwork and they enjoyed that too. They relived the experience of egging and toilet papering an innocent bystander's house in the sixth or seventh grade. And they thought it was a blast. And like I said, I missed out on a bonding experience. I was taken further away from this clique of kids whose company I really enjoyed, who I mostly liked, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. I did a lot of stuff as a kid and as a young adult that, well, wasn't necessarily 100% completely legal. (laughs) But I never wanted to hurt anybody else. I never wanted to inconvenience anybody else. If anything ever happened to anyone, I wanted it to be me. But that was the first time. Do you remember having an experience like that? I mean, peer pressure is a big part of it. And there were many other times, especially as a kid, when you care about this sort of thing. Hopefully, you manage to divorce yourself from the concept of peer pressure, from the idea of you know, the crowd of people that are surrounding you expecting you to do something and you feeling like you have to do it. Once you become an adult, a self-contained individual that's made their own choices in life. Some adults are susceptible to it, but hopefully you're done with that stuff by the time you're done with adolescence. There are many other times where I just couldn't go along. Maybe times when a kid was getting picked on. Maybe times when somebody was talking smack about a teacher that they didn't like, and I just thought it was a low blow. All these things sort of happened in adolescence. But the first time I remember my personal sense of dignity and my personal moral code being compromised or being asked to be compromised was that egging and toilet papering event in the sixth or seventh grade where I was like, nope, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to watch the movie. I will not take part of this. And like I said, it cost me a bit of adolescent social standing, which is a big deal. But even back then, I knew it didn't cost me anywhere near as much as it would have if I'd gone out and done something that I wasn't comfortable with. If I'd gone out and done something that hurt somebody else for the sake of my own amusement. Somehow, somewhere along the way, maybe because my parents drilled it into me, maybe it's just because that's how I'm wired, I just couldn't take pleasure in causing someone else 
any kind of pain. Not my thing. And one way I got very lucky with my parents is that my mom and dad often said, hey, if there's ever anything going on that other people are doing and you don't feel okay about doing it, we don't care what it is. I mean, I thought it was the don't do drugs and drink chat that they were having with me, but I think it blanket applied to absolutely everything. Things like egging someone else's house. They made it very clear to me from the get go. If you ever don't feel comfortable doing something that everybody else is doing, don't do it. Don't do it because you don't want to do it. And they somehow made me feel like I was a rebel. I was a little bit more dangerous. I was a little bit more punk rock by standing up in that way. But it was a formative experience that made me realize our dignity is ultimately all that we have when it comes down to it. Have we violated our own personal moral code? Will we be able to put our head down on the pillow and go to sleep knowing we're okay with ourselves based on our actions? And thinking about this, I start to feel really bad for John Kelly. Real Radio. 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 104.1. Where the left and right come together for fundamental truths. A.D. on the radio, on Twitter at A.D.S.X.E. So yeah, I guess the thing that made me think about personal compromises to my dignity, my own moral code. The decision to not go and egg that kid's house when I was in the sixth grade or seventh grade or whenever it was, the thing that got me thinking about all this and the importance of your dignity and your ability to put your head down on the pillow at the end of the night, knowing that you lived up to the code that you set yourself, your ability to know that you didn't compromise yourself, your ability to know that you did in your mind, what was right. The thing that got me thinking about how important that is and how really ultimately we don't have anything else than that was What's going on with John Kelly? Now, you may or may not be a supporter of John Kelly. You might think he's a nasty piece of work. You might think he's a little bit of a blip on the Trump radar, whatever the case may be. John Kelly, John Kelly, I don't think wanted to be the White House chief of staff. He was sort of goaded into it by Trump. I think Trump kind of, he didn't beg him, but I think he said, look, my house is out of order and I need someone like you to get it in order. And it just appears that he's getting sucked up into the Trump dignity eating machine. John Kelly, in case you did not know, is a decorated military veteran, a retired United States Marine Corps general. He was previously the Secretary of Homeland Security, but he'd been commander of the United States Southern Command the Unified Combatant Command. He'd been responsible for American military operations in Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. He had previously served as a commanding general of the Multinational Force West in Iraq from February 2008 to February 2009. And as the commander of the Marine Force Reserve and Marine Forces North in October 2009. He succeeded General M, uh, General Douglas M. Fraser as commander of U.S. Southern Command back in 2012. He's a decorated military veteran and a family man. Been married to the same woman since 1976. They've raised three children together. And sadly, his son, who followed in his footsteps, His 29-year-old son, First Lieutenant Robert Michael Kelly, was killed in action when he stepped on a landmine while leading a platoon of Marines on patrol in Afghanistan. He's got a lot to be proud of. He's lived his life by a certain code. And he was shaky on the whole idea of becoming Donald Trump's chief of staff. Going, this this looks like an S-storm. This is not how I choose to operate. I'm a military man. And, you know, if you're like me, you love members of our military. I specifically love members of our military for selfish reasons. My friends that are veterans, you know what they do? 
what they say they're going to do. They show up when they're supposed to show up. My veteran friends never put me through that. Oh, you're there at Starbucks already? Well, I'm just getting out of the shower. Order me a latte that all my other flaky ass friends do. The veterans that I work with, oh, I love working with them. There's this guy, Jean. I think I've talked about him before, but he is head of our board ops at one of the radio station clusters I work at. And he's a Navy veteran. I think he's in the reserve still. But you know what I like about working with Jean? Like I said, it's a completely selfish thing. But when he says he's going to do something, he does it. When I ask him to do something, he'll tell me yes or no, depending on what his availability to do, availability to do that thing is. And I know he's never going to try and weasel out of something. If he says he can't do something, there's a legitimate reason for that. And then he just freaking does it. They show up to hang out on time. They do the job that they're supposed to do, my military friends, my veteran friends. And I love that. And that's because they come from a background where if you don't do the things that you say you're going to do, and if you don't explain that for whatever reason they now can't be done, it's a real deal situation. People could die. And so for that reason... They make wonderfully accountable friends and wonderfully accountable employees, employee, employees and coworkers. My love for my friends and coworkers that were part of the military is, I suppose, selfish in that they make me feel more comfortable and happy. But you need that. And it's the reliability, the accountability that I appreciate so much. It's that sort of dignity that we were talking about. It's that idea of a personal moral code of accountability that most of them seem to have that I really, really like being around. And you have to imagine that a guy like John Kelly, a guy like John Francis Kelly, who made it to the rank of United States Marine Corps General, has to not only be a badass, but also be someone who has lived by a set of rules. The set of rules that the military has imposed upon him and the set of rules that he's opposed, imposed upon himself in his own mind. Tough guy. And there's no way you get to be a guy like him without having some hard and fast ways that you've decided to live your life. And then, and then, to have your boss's press folks tell the whole world that you were pitching a hissy fit because you didn't care for the breakfast you were served? Yeah, I feel so bad for this guy. For more stimulation and less irritation, 9 out of 10 doctors choose KPRC AM 950. Houston's more stimulating talk radio. Don't get the blues, get all the news. We mean all of you. Guys out there in Radio Land. All aboard! He's back. AD on the radio. Give it up, yeah. Give it up, yeah. Bring this on, bring this on. Come on, come on. So yeah, John Kelly's supposed to be on the outs. Apparently, he's kind of being ghosted by Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump, if nothing else, is really great for a man of his advanced years at absorbing pop culture, current events, new pieces of technology. I mean, clearly Twitter is a very big deal for him. Is your dad on Twitter? <laughs> Do they use it as much as Donald Trump? No. Donald Trump is up and hip and down with the kids and a user of the hippity hop lingo. He understands what's going on in the digital space. He understands the millennial way of going through the world. And I guess he understands the idea of ghosting too, because he appears to be ghosting John Kelly. Sources saying that basically Donald Trump's folks have stopped telling him when meetings are happening. And here's the thing. John Kelly is supposed to be out sooner rather than later. There was a moment where everybody thought it was going to be like any second now, but I think he's going to wait till his one year anniversary as Donald Trump's chief of staff and be like, okay, that was fun. Bye. But 
hanging in till that last moment doesn't look like it's going to be an easy thing. Only because, look, we were talking about this guy. This is a guy who is a Marine Corps general, decorated military hero, a man who has lived, no doubt, by a certain very specific moral code, a man who is able to preserve his own dignity, a man who has not compromised himself, a man who's probably able to think about his life and his actions and put his head down on the pillow and go, I'm okay with that. Maybe I've been asked to be, maybe I've been asked to do some very difficult things in the service of my country. Maybe my comfort levels and boundaries have been tested. But what probably hadn't been tested was his personal sense of dignity. This was a guy that I can't imagine was thrown under the bus all that often. And, well, it's happening now. Boy, is it happening. Did you see that whole sort of like thing where, Kelly looked very, very uncomfortable around Trump. A video of President Trump speaking about Germany on his European trip basically drew the attention of the press of the world when they noted that in this one photo, his chief of staff, John Kelly, looked uncomfortable. He was there in the background. And there's a million ways to interpret a picture. I don't put a whole lot of stock into this sort of thing. But... The idea is you look at this picture and John Kelly's like, Muh? what? That's not okay. And, you know, Donald Trump's talking. Donald Trump's talking, saying things like, Germany's totally controlled by Russia. I think that's what's being said in this picture. Donald Trump was being like, oh, yeah, breakfast, cool. But, you know, Germany, totally under the thumb of Putin whatever, past the OJ. And it's during that moment where the picture of John Kelly was snapped of him going, Meh. now there's all sorts of people, <laughs> the folks over the Washington Post, they were kind of reaching on this one. They, uh, they got a body language expert. Okay. <laughs> they got a body language expert to say for the sake of an article that Kelly's expression was, uh, a conveyance of the fact that he wants to be anywhere but where he is. And as much as I'm like, okay, body language expert, I got to imagine that it's not that far from the truth. <laughs> Here's the thing. A lot has been made of this picture. A lot has been made of this picture. It wasn't a good look. John Kelly's look, not a good look, according to the press of the world. The vultures that wanted to make something out of it that maybe wasn't there were all over it like like something all over something else. So it became incumbent upon Sarah Huckabee Sanders to come up with an explanation for John Kelly's expression. The thing while Donald Trump was talking, saying things like Russia or Putin, uh, Germany's Putin, Germany or a bunch of Putin's bitches or, or whatever the hell it was he said. And they came up with, they came up with a reason as to why John Kelly looked so uncomfortable in that moment. It's the grimace that has been interpreted around the world. One of the most controversial facial expressions in modern history, John Kelly's face as Donald Trump's, Trump's talking on his current European trip. So, why was he so bent out of shape, according to Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders? He didn't like breakfast. Yeah, he wasn't okay with breakfast. <laughs> uh, where is it? What did she say? Yeah, Sarah Huckabee Sanders said that John Kelly was displeased that he was expecting a full breakfast and there were only pastries and cheese. <laughs> oh, man. Well, there you go. Like I said, it's the... Donald Trump dignity shredding machine. Here's John Kelly. Here's John Kelly having achieved and accomplished and sacrificed everything that he's achieved and accomplished and sacrificed for this country. To have his personal dignity shredded. Ah, he's just bitching because he didn't like the food. Pastry? Cheese? What is this garbage? Uh, he's a Marine. What was the line from Rambo? 
He's been trained to eat what would make a billy goat puke. This continental breakfast is the end. I've been through war and war as hell, but pastries and cheese? I don't think so. Kelly, don't play that. Also, I, I think there was fruit. I saw in a picture that there was fruit on that table. Uh, I've been, uh, I've been in service of this country for my entire life. I'm a decorated military veteran that sacrificed everything for the sake of that flag and my country. And if I don't get my eggs Benedict with hollandaise sauce, blue cheese, and a smoked truffle quiche with whole grain gluten-free crust with maple bacon and a melange of fruit cups plus the mimosas I become so accustomed to enjoy as a Marine, this is the end. The hell, man. What the hell? So I feel bad for that guy. I feel bad for that guy. I mean, look, it's been pretty clear that he's on his way out for a while now. I think he's trying to hang in there, trying to make it to the one-year anniversary before he checks the hell out, but that doesn't look like it's going to be an easy thing for him. The report that we've been hearing is that his role has been diminished in the White House. Basically, they stop telling him when meetings are. I think the big part of the re- a big part of the reason for that is that uh, Fox News executive, that dude, uh, that Bill Shine guy, he's working in the White House, and right now he's Trump's flavor of the week. It's got to be such a weird thing. It's got to be such a weird thing accepting a job to work with Donald Trump. Working for Donald Trump is like the Hunger Games. You don't know if you're going to make it a year like Kelly. You don't know if you're going to be scaramoochied in a number of hours. (laughs) But here's the thing. Bill Shine, former Fox News exec. This is Trump's sort of people. This is a media guy. This is a guy that understands the media games that Donald Trump plays so adeptly. This is a guy that understands milking political opinion for personal gain. This is Trump's sort of individual. He wanted John Kelly to be the dignified face of the White House, and apparently it's just not working out. And Kelly was all all opposed to Bill Schein being hired. And you could understand why. Uh, I'm I'm a Marine Corps general. I'm a decorated military man. And you want to bring in the guy from Fox and hand him some of my responsibility? You kind of feel like that's the same thing? No. Kelly opposed the hiring of Shine and has seen his role diminished in pretty humiliating ways. Like I said, there's reports coming in saying that they basically stopped telling Kelly when the meetings are. People leave him off the calendar. Like he's not getting the Outlook invites or something like that. Donald Trump, like I said before, is basically ghosting him. Just sort of stop calling. We used to hang out all the time. Now, not so much. What's going on? I thought we were good. I thought we were moving forward. I thought, oh, yeah. Just kind of got busy and been out of town a lot. And Well, can we get together? You know, maybe. I did. Yeah, oh, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. Uh, how about uh, the 12th of never? <laughs> basically seems to be what Donald Trump is doing to his chief of staff. This decorated military veteran that has sacrificed everything for his country. Basically not having his calls returned. Basically not being invited to go hang with the Trump bros when the Trump bros are around. And I think I think this chipping away at his dignity started pretty early on. Where he made it tough for people to get to Donald Trump. He was like, all right, I got to keep this guy focused on the business of being president. I got to keep him, you know, on task. I'm a military guy. That's what I can do. And apparently one of the first ways people started circumventing Kelly that drove him freaking crazy was they'd get good with Melania and have Melania convey messages to Donald Trump. It's weird. It's like courtesans at Versailles. (laughs) It's this weird sociopolitical animal that we've all heard Washington DC is that's become that sociopolitical animal on steroids 
has become more socio and less political <laughs> ever since Donald Trump got in. But yeah, apparently one of the first compromises to Kelly's authority was the fact that he was trying to keep Donald Trump focused. He was trying to keep him on task. He was trying to limit the number of people that got an audience with him and said, if you're going to have an audience with him, you got to get in line. We've got a protocol. We've got things that we got to handle, things that we got to do. We've got priorities we have to maintain. So you take a number, you take a number, and you take a number. And what the hell? You're talking to his wife? Now, as a military guy, that's got to absolutely not not work. Accountability, a chain of command, people doing what they say they're going to do is the foundation of every military person that I'm a friends with life. And to have that violated in that way, it's freaking bananas. Especially when you're serving your country at a very high level. Another person who uh, I guess is described as a Republican close to the White House said that President Trump hopes that Shine's growing presence in the administration will push Kelly to resign. So it's one step further than ghosting him. You didn't like this guy? I'm going to start spending all my time with this guy. I'm going to hire him. I'm going to give him a job. I'm going to give him authority that you don't want him to have. And hopefully that's just going to save me the hassle of firing you. Hopefully that's going to save me the hassle of having to come to you and talk to you, have that difficult conversation. Hopefully that'll make it so you just decide to take your medals and go home. That's apparently how a veteran like Kelly is being treated. This, by the way, is not a right or a left thing. If you're like a lot of people that have listened to the show for a lot of time, you know that I'm very difficult to pin down politically, and there's a reason for that. I don't believe in Republicans and Democrats. I don't think they're that freaking different. I don't take sides. I view them as Coke and Pepsi, brown sugary water that's probably pretty bad for you, but you're going to drink a certain amount of it in your life, so you might as well get used to it. I don't play political sides because I think that's, well... I think that diminishes your ability to point out hypocrisy and wrongdoing wherever you see it. So I like to remain lean and agile and loyal to doing what I think is right, as opposed to loyal to a political party. So this is not about going after Donald Trump. There's probably a lot of Democrats that are only too stoked to see somebody like John Kelly get their short end of the stick. There's people that love the idea that there's unrest and upset and chaos in Trump's White House. And uh, I just can't bring myself to participate in that kind of thing because I feel like, ah, this guy, this guy has done so much in the service of our country. This guy lost a son in the service of our country. And this guy deserves to be treated with a little dignity. And I don't know how he's going to leave his gig. But I hope that whatever kind of exit strategy he, strategy he's working on, it involves him leaving with his head held as high as possible. Sometimes you just know you're done. You're longing for that shining sun. You walk these streets most every day. You're waiting to get washed away. AD on the radio. So you would think, right, that it was such a time-honored tradition. It's something that people have been doing for so long. The idea of being a hobo, someone who hops trains to get where they're going. You would think people would have that sort of routine down pat. I've never tried to do it, so I don't know exactly how it goes. I mean, I grew up in England, and the public transportation system over there is really next level. People tend to take subways and buses and trains significantly more than they drive, and it makes life a lot easier, especially if you're in a city like London. So I grew up taking trains an awful lot, I think more than most of my American friends. But I've never tried to jump a train illegally because, you know, it was always, you know, Three pounds fifty if you wanted to take a train to the next town over to go hang out with your friends or whatever the hell the case may be. 
But you would think, you would think that the art of hoboing, being the old practice that it is, had been mastered by the people that were into it a little bit more than this. Did you see that two guys in Ohio jumped on a freight train and rode it for 60 miles? But they were hanging on to the outside, and then finally, because the train wasn't slowing down, while they were on the outside of the train, they had to call 911. They realized that they were in a very bad position. They probably weren't going to be able to hold on that much longer. They'd been riding it on the outside for 60 miles. The train wasn't slowing down. They weren't able to get off. They were in bad shape. So they called 911 because the train was going too fast for them to jump off. And after they got arrested, the guy who made the call was so freaked out, he couldn't shut up in the police cruiser. And I'll play that for you in just a little bit. Right now, though, you know how we were talking about ethics, a personal moral code, the time that you made decisions as a kid and the time that you maybe made a decision not to go in on something or not to vandalize someone else's place or not to make fun of someone, the time that you took a stand because you knew in your mind it was the right thing to do. Well, if you needed further proof that whatever it was that you did was the right thing to do, (laughs) here's John Mulaney with proof that your childhood indiscretions are capable of coming back to haunt you years and years later. Check this out. I found out recently that jokes don't do well in court. So, some friends of mine were sued in college for property damage, and they were guilty. And the lawsuit dragged on for years and years. And eventually, I got a call when I was 28 years old, and it was my friend from college. He said, hey, that lawsuit with my neighbor is still dragging on, and my neighbor just subpoenaed all my emails from college that mentioned him or the lawsuit. And I said, well, that's crazy, but why are you calling me? And he said, because you should be concerned. (laughs) said, I have an email here from junior year where I wrote, hey, guys, I'm going to miss practice tonight because I have to meet with my neighbor about that lawsuit thing. And you replied, hey, do you want me to kill that guy for you? Because it sounds like he sucks, and I will totally kill that guy for you. Okay, see you at improv practice. Of all the sentences in that email I would be ashamed to have read out loud in a court of law, I think the top one is see you at improv practice. Strange, the passage of time. (laughs) Like I said, uh, it's important to stick to your guns, your personal ethical and moral code, even when you're a kid, because you don't know when things are going to come back to haunt you in that way. So there you have it. Oh, man, like I said. The uh, the inexperienced hobos that we were talking about earlier, these two guys in Ohio who jumped on a freight train and rode it for 60 miles and then had to call 911 because... (laughs) I had to call 911 because the freaking train wouldn't slow down and they had to get off some way. Um, After they got arrested, the guy who made the call was so freaked out that he couldn't shut the hell up in the police cruiser. Check this out. I'm on a train. You're on a train. Yeah, and it's going really fast, and I don't know where it's going. Where are you doing on the train? (laughs) Well, I uh, really don't know. It's better than walking, scaring the shit out of me. This thing was flying, man, for real. I'm not even going to lie about it. I don't know where I'm at, and I should have never got on the train, and I know it was a stupid idea, and I never will again. I can tell you that right now. Yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess alcohol was involved. I got to tell you, this actually sort of makes me miss taking trains. I mean, I never did it on the outside of the train. I was always entirely less daring and entirely more pedestrian in that I favored the inside of a train car than the outside of a train car when trying to go distances of 60 miles from city to city. But I miss trains. Trains were, like I said, a bit of a way of life in England. It was kind of how you got around. Here, trains are, well, look, there's a lot more land to cover with railroad tracks in America. And obviously there's trains all over the place, but the idea of providing a fully functioning city to every freaking city railway system in a country the size of America, as opposed to in England, which is roughly the size of New York state is considerably more of a large and unwieldy task. So it's not surprising that we're more of a car culture. And look, when you have a public transportation system, You're kidding yourself if you think that taxes aren't going to be in some way, shape, or form involved. And, well, I'm a laissez-faire free market capitalist, but I'm also into the idea of community. I believe in community. I believe in the purpose of shared spaces. 
I love things like public parks. I love things like public transportation because there are these moments where you are, well, you're in it with everyone else. A subway, a train, a bus. These things are social equalizers. There's parts of America where you don't wind up taking a bus or something like that unless you've made some bad choices in life. Like, I grew up taking the bus, and when I got to Houston, I was like, oh, I'll just, you know, I don't have a car yet because I just moved there from New York City where a car wasn't necessary. I was like, I'll just take the bus to this job interview <laughs> going on. And someone was like, no, <laughs> you can't do that. I was like, why not? Well, first and foremost, you never know how long it's going to take one to show up. Second of all, it's going to be hot as all get out. This is Texas in the summertime. And if you're going to a job interview, which I was, you're going to sweat through every last piece of clothing that you have. Then you're going to have to get out blocks away and walk there and it'll be, it'll be all bad. So there's some places where public transportation isn't the great social equalizer, but in places like London and New York City, everybody takes the bus, everybody takes the tube, everybody takes the train. And this idea of a shared space that we're all in on together, where we're just going, hey, be cool with this, because we want to keep it nice for ourselves and for each other. I think there's tremendous value in that. Yep, that's what I think. the stimulation to the professionals everyone is so smart kbrc more stimulating talk radio there's something happening here and you should know what it is (laughs) the dumbing up of america now more ad on the radio So you and I have been talking about public transportation, and you know, one of the great things, like we said, about public transportation is even before Lyft and Uber and ride-sharing services like that, it was doing a great deal to help people cut down on drunk driving, which is, lest we forget, a very real problem. I had to stop drinking, though, because I got tired, like, waking up in my car driving 90. (laughs) You know, you know, trying to talk to the police when your mouth don't work. That make drunk people want to talk But you can bet If somebody drunk He gonna talk You know what I mean You ever be driving The police ease up Put them bright lights on you And your brain start going Don't worry about it Just be cool Everything Don't worry Just to be cool Now straighten up Just put your arm Put your arm on, on the window That's right Put your arm on the window Be cool Lay back Alright Just get it together You're ready now When, when you come up Say everything's fine Alright Just say Everything's fine Everything's fine Alright Now that's what you see In your brain But your mouth Has made up its mind Your mouth be saying I'm gonna say these words The way I want to Please wake up under mine How you feeling? Yeah, right. <laughs> Want to get out? <laughs> she ain't out. Robin Williams had a similar bit where he said, you practice the line over and over again. What seems to be the problem, officer? What seems to be the problem, officer? What seems to be the problem, officer? And then you wind up saying, gabaju baba abaja, or something of that nature. This was, of course, from way back in the day, Richard Pryor talking about that. And you know, I think there was a time where Cops, certainly not in my lifetime. I'm guessing not in yours as well. But I heard there was a time where drunk driving was like, hey, 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 you pour out that rest of the container and you quit drinking behind the wheel. You save it till when you get home. I think that was the thing. And now, now we know it's a horrible, awful, egregious, miserable, terrible thing to do to yourself and another human being. There's absolutely no excuse, no excuse ever, 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 ever in life to drink and drive. So please... Whatever the hell the case, whatever the hell the case may be, in your instance, I, I had a rule. I had a rule back in the day. I haven't had anything to drink in years and years and years. Not because, well, I had a problem with drinking, but like I said, I quit drinking when I got to be about eighteen years old, because I was a drinking age in England, and once it stopped representing any kind of rebellion, 
I, I was no longer interested in it. Once it stopped representing any kind of rebellion, it became more about conformity. And, well, that part of my brain that was hardwired to be punk rock and go against the grain and go against what all my other friends were saying was a cool thing to do, decided that drinking was one of those things that I was going to have no part of because, like I said, it seemed more about conformity than rebellion to me. So, I quit drinking at an early age. And... The other thing was, like, I just got these really bad hangovers. I didn't like them. And I know, like, to be talking about a hangover at age 17 is one thing, but I do remember feeling miserable. I mean, alcohol is a depressant. And I think alcohol really kind of depressed me significantly because I would wake up not with just a, oh, I have a headache. I feel lousy. I feel like I've got an upset stomach or I might puke or something. Like, no, no. I woke up feeling like the whole world was caving in on me and I was a terrible human being. And how could I look at myself in the face? And that was after really tying one on as a teenager. And I noticed as I got older, as I got closer to the legal drinking age of 18, the sentiment of the world is ending that I used to get when I woke up after having tied one on was only getting stronger. So I decided it wasn't for me. I decided that I'm a reasonably ambitious guy. There's a lot of things I want to do with my time on this earth and a limited number of days to do those things. And so I should probably get rid of anything that's going to slow me down. And it seemed like alcohol was going to slow me down. So I gave it up a long time ago. But even when I did drink... And I had my driver's license. I had a policy, even as a young kid, of going, I'm never going to drink and drive on the same day. If I've had a sip of alcohol, I'm not getting behind a wheel, the wheel of a car that day. And that was my blanket statement, and one that I think would serve everybody well. But there's really no excuse. Like I said, that Richard Pryor bit comes from a day and age where cops, I think, said, hey, 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 you finish that and head home now, as opposed to you're going to jail. There's really no excuse. Everything that you need to not drink and drive, to make the right choice with Uber, with Lyft, with ride-sharing services, with all of the above, is there for you. So, all right, end of sermon. I'm going to climb down off of my soapbox and just say, please, for the sake of yourselves and others, if there's ever any doubt, don't drink and drive. So, did you see why people are all upset, why people are all bent out of shape with the folks over at Forbes magazine? It's an interesting one. Basically, they're really angry about who wound up on the Forbes list of the richest self-made people in America. Look, if you're like most people I know, you worked really hard for every last thing that you've got. And you really, ultimately, kind of put it all together from more or less nothing, and you did it more or less on your on your own. And this is why people are upset with a person who Forbes has described as self-made. Who are we talking about? What exactly are we talking about? We'll get into it a little later on in the show. Right now, though, quick update on George Clooney as we get into the news. My Witness News, the events of today. George Clooney was in that accident, the scooter accident, a little while ago in Italy. Quick update on George Clooney. The full extent of his facial injuries are not clear. But doctors say it's a guarantee that he's still better looking than you or I. Cardi B and Offset have named their new baby girl Culture Kiari Cephas. Yes, Cardi B and Offset have named their new baby girl Culture Kiari Cephas. Would that make her dad Offset? If the kid's called Culture Kiari Cephas, would that make him pop culture? (laughs) I hope it would. Uh, Yeah, Culture Kiari Cephas. Just in case you were wondering if Cardi B and Offset still enjoy the giggle weed, apparently they do. Oh, man. Did you see who's celebrating a birthday? Today, I think. Yeah, yeah. Big birthday. It's being celebrated today by one of the most well-known people on the face of the planet. Never kind of been more well-known than now, despite an especially long and glittering career. Who are we talking about? Who's celebrating a big birthday today? Well, it's interesting because despite their massive celebrity, despite the fact that they are one of the most well-known people on the planet at the moment... And the fact that they're celebrating her big birthday. This is a party that nobody wants to go to. Nobody wants to go to this guy's birthday party. Why? Because it's Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby turns 81 years old today. Nah. Knowing Cosby, that party will be a real snooze. Tyler Perry is warning fans of a scheme using his name. Apparently, people are being duped into seeing bad movies just because they have his name at the front of the title. There you go. The director of the Jumanji sequel said that filming will start next year. (laughs) 
Uh, if you can't wait that long for a movie starring The Rock, there's always every other movie in theaters at the moment. That guy no- doesn't stop. It's insane. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. And you know what? The movie going public doesn't appear to be tired of him. What's that new movie he's got? I saw the trailer for it. And it's like him saving his family in a skyscraper that's been attacked by terrorists. I saw the trailer for it. I was like, oh, sweet. They remade Die Hard. That makes sense. The Rock remaking Die Hard. And then it wasn't Die Hard. They had like... (laughs) uh, The Rock saving his family from a skyscraper full of terrorists. Like Bruce Willis has got to be going like, oh, well, I'm going to retire from this lawsuit. What the hell, man? (laughs) What's that movie called? I I don't know. (laughs) In other movie news, Rob Lowe. Rob Lowe recently put his California mansion on the market for $47 million. It has breathtakingly beautiful views. But that's just when Rob looks in the mirror. Uh, all right, let's talk a little bit about this Forbes list, shall we? Because it's an interesting one. Forbes put out a list of America's richest self-made women, which immediately makes you think of Oprah. Oprah Winfrey. A woman born into poverty and poverty in rural Mississippi to a teenage single mother, raised by her grandmother, raped at the age of nine, got pregnant and lost a child at the age of 14. And since her family needed money, she started working at a radio station part time while she was still in high school. Now she's worth three point one billion with a B dollars. If you think self-made, you might think of Oprah and we could all understand that. Why? Well, let's talk a little bit about being self-made, shall we? I mean, I think a lot of us are kind of, in essence, self-made. We might not be multi-billionaires the way Oprah is, but if you're like most people I know, you worked really hard for every last thing that you've got. You really put all of it together for more or less nothing, and you more or less did it on your own. Maybe you had some help from parents or relatives or something like that, but ultimately it's fallen to you. That home that you live in, the refrigerator full of food, the job that you have that pays for all of them. It's one of those situations where no one's really going to do that except for you. And no matter what it is you've got, you should be proud of everything that it is because you made it happen. That's that's self-made. And this is why people are upset with Forbes. If you think self-made, you probably don't think of the Kim Kim Kardashian kid sister, Kylie Jenner, who basically started her career on third base thanks to her appearances on her family's reality shows beginning when she was 10 years old. And yet Kylie is also on the list, same list as Oprah, because Forbes wanted to sell some magazines. Let's just be real here. Kylie Jenner is on this list of self-made women. Uh, Who who else is on there? Uh, Taylor Swift. Beyonce, Judge Judy, Barbara Streisand, Judge Judy. Did you know, who do you suppose the richest television personality is? It's freaking Judge Judy. I mean, I guess you can't really count Oprah, but Judge Judy is worth $400 million. You want to know why? That show, she owns it. From the get-go, she was like, I, I own this. Not just appearing as talent. I'm a judge. I don't need to be anything. I don't need to be a part of anything that I don't own, at least a piece of. So Judge Judy, little old Judge Judy, worth $400 million, which is the same as Barbara Streisand, also $400 million. Celine Dion, $430 million. Madonna, $590 million. Oprah, $3.1 billion. And Kylie Jenner, she's worth $900 million. To be fair, Kylie did take her platform and capitalize on it. She was rich and famous so young that it's hard to imagine her producing a self-made hot pocket from a microwave. (laughs) Self-made and Kylie Jenner. uh, These are not things that necessarily will belong in the same sentence unless is not is in there. But yeah, people are angry about Kylie Jenner winding up on this Forbes list of America's richest self-made women. Unless, unless self-made means talentless opportunist who cashes in on the fact that your skanky sister made a bad porno tape with the D-list wannabe rapper 15 years ago in some strange dialect we weren't previously aware of, I don't think that they're using the expression self-made all that well. Surgically made. Nah, that would probably be significantly more accurate. You know, I was having this conversation about the nature of being self-made with one of my radio honcho buddies, and he was like, you know who is self-made? I was like, who? He was like, you. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, that talk radio show of yours. 
that took some vision. Taking the guy that does Tool and Metallica for his day job and thinking he's going to have something viable to add to the political discourse. No one was looking for that, but you did it. You made it. And you're what's next. Your show's going to blow up huge all over the country and you will be self-made. And maybe that happens. Maybe it doesn't. But I was quick to tell him, nah, not self-made. The people that make this show are you. The community that we've built around here. It's really more of a community than a show, really. You and I get to hang out. We have laughs and conversations and discuss news and what's going on in our heads and hearts and minds. And, well, because of you, we get to do this every single day. So self-made, not so much. But what we've made together, I'm incredibly proud of. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you for being a part of my radio family. 